Hi, welcome to this webinar about the book Essentialism. This is one of the best books that I have read uh, really in the last couple of years. And this book is about how do we get the most important things done without burning out? Because these days it's actually easy to not get the important things done because of all the distractions that are happening. And this book talks about why there's those distractions and how do we um, create healthy boundaries so that we're not being pulled in many different directions. I want to take a moment to thank those who were able to join me for the live webinar. Laura, Shweta, Andy, Bernie, Frank, and Angela, great to have you here. Uh, those of you who are live, I do um, welcome you to chat. And uh, any notes that you hear um, that, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, keep the chat just private to those who are live. So, so feel free to chat. I'm not going to uh, keep the notes for the replay. Those who are watching the replay, I welcome you to comment below. Uh, anything that you're hearing that really resonates with you and especially something you want to apply into your business or into your life. I'd love to know what that is. Okay, so this book uh, is, is really good and it's actually a book really meant, it was written for people who are in teams and corporations, but a lot of the book can actually be applied to solopreneurs, uh, which I think most of us are watching this. It can be applied to your personal life as well. So I'm gonna actually focus this presentation on how to apply this book to our personal life and to a kind of solopreneur type business. If you are working in a team or you manage a team, I do highly recommend you read the book itself because the book is, uh, there's a lot more advice for sort of team management that I did include in this webinar and also didn't include in the notes for the book, which I have 21 pages of notes. And since this is only going to be about a 50 minute webinar, um, I'm not gonna read 21 pages to you, but I am going to share with you some of the highlights. And as always with these webinars, I'm gonna be saying things that of course are not in the notes as well. So you get to enjoy both. But the key I want you to focus on for this presentation is listen for one thing that really excites you and Think about how you can apply this one thing into your life and into your business as soon as possible. One of those concepts I learned a couple years ago, which I love, is the speed of implementation. The faster you can apply what you learn, the more likely you're actually going to apply it. A lot of us you know, watch webinars, we watch videos, we read things, and what we, do, what we don't do is apply them right away. And if we don't apply them right away, chances are, you're not gonna apply them, okay? So listen for one thing you're excited to apply as soon as possible. All right, so let me get going on why essentialism is so important in our time today and why it's gonna get even more important. There are two main reasons. One is technology and the other one is marketing. Technology, as we know, has changed so quickly, okay, and has become so embedded in our lives in the past 20 years that the world, especially the first world, I should say, is completely different now than 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, who had cell phones? Very few people. 20 years ago, the internet wasn't really that, uh, it didn't come into the mainstream yet. 20 years ago, we couldn't easily connect with just about anyone we want to connect with in the world through Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or Google+, okay? So hyper-connectivity has, grown so rapidly that it has way outpaced human evolution. Human evolution happens <laughs> over millennia, over thousands, actually I would say tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years is how we evolve. I mean, that's just how biology works. Internet is the last 20 years. So do not blame yourself if you feel overwhelmed, <laughs> okay? You can rightly <laughs> blame the evolution of technology. Now, it doesn't mean that just because you're blaming, we're blaming technology and we're blaming marketing the industry, we can make choices that allow us to have healthy boundaries around these things. So think about all of the demands on your attention every single day. In the past, demands on our attention were letters that came in the mail, okay? The telephone ringing, people knocking on our door. And these things were relatively uh, scarce compared to what we're experiencing today. Today, you get notifications on your phone all the time. 
you get onto the computer, you get, you see new emails come in and notifications. By the way, if you have notifications about new emails coming in, I encourage you to turn them off because you do not need to see whenever, whatever new emails come in. You don't work in a life and death situation where you need to immediately see an email, otherwise someone might get harmed, <laughs> okay? It's usually emails that come in are marketers trying to get your attention, okay? So notifications have grown so rapidly that are no wonder we feel overwhelmed, okay? So um, uh, also, we now live in a internet, internet global connected world, which means we no longer live in tribes where there was social norms that allowed a sense of balance in life that evolved over hundreds of years. Now we're all figuring out what does it mean, what does etiquette mean online? You know, uh, when someone requests a friend to be on Facebook, what does that mean? We are, we're learning that now. Of course, you use Facebook for a couple of years. You kind of get that when someone requests to be your friend, they don't literally mean, can I be your friend? <laughs> okay. It just means, hey, you want to follow my content on Facebook, right? So we're, we're, we're all, the entire society is now being brought very, very rapidly to a stage where we have to learn new norms and etiquette. No wonder we feel overwhelmed. And we have all these friends on Facebook that our human evolution only allows us to have friends with maybe or, or to know on a first name basis, to have some relationship with, with about 150 people. That's Dunbar's number. The researcher Dunbar uh, found out that tribes were about 150 people-ish. And then beyond that, the tribes either broke down or needed to form new tribes. So human evolution has not caught up with the hyperconnectivity that we're experiencing today. The second reason why you feel overwhelmed is because marketing is now connected with technology to bring you ever more requests on your attention. Every single time you come to the computer and surf the internet, you see advertisements all the time. You try to watch a video, advertisements. You go outside, there are ads now on the sides of bus stops, right? Billboards. Uh, you know, you, go, you walk into a mall, tons of ads everywhere. So there's lots of demands for your attention. Not the same as how we evolved as human beings. So no wonder we are feeling overwhelmed all the time. It's not your fault. And so the overwhelm causes anxiety. And guess what? All these things request on your attention. It drains your willpower, which then prevent you from making smarter decisions, okay? So this is all very important to know the context of why you feel this way, this ang underlying anxiety and this underlying overwhelm that we all experience. It's because of technology and especially marketing's connection with technology now. And also, oh, an another important thing, there's a marketing message that says, you can have it all. You can have it all. Now, I think that probably came out of the 50s, right? But nowadays, especially nowadays, you can't have it all because there, there's so many opportunities and things for you to buy and, and the people you're supposed to become, okay? You can't literally have it all anymore, at least not immediately right now. You're trying to have perfect health, you know, perfect career, perfect relationships, right? Eventually, with enough time and enough personal development, you can create a balance among it all but you can't literally have it all. We see heroes in the media, uh, especially business heroes who supposedly have it all. There may be, they may be billionaires or other you know, rich people and what we see are celebrities and we see their good sides, actually celebrities, we see a lot of their, their, broken, their broken hearts and, and broken lives as well. But really, a lot of people whose lives seem amazing are not showing you the brokenness of their personal life or the brokenness of their health or whatever you don't see, right? So the whole you can have it all message, I think is quite damaging. I think what we can have is we can have a hope for a balance even now, which is what this book is going to help us achieve. And then we can keep growing into a balance where we can, as we grow our capacity, as we grow our skills, okay, at managing our relationships and our managing technology, we can have higher quality in these different areas of life, right? And just want to take a quick moment to thank, uh, I see Bernie and Laura um, and Andy uh, 
putting some notes in the in the chat. So that's very interesting. Thank you. I'm going to look forward to reading that as well. Um, and okay, so um, let's go on to uh, the first concept I love from the book, which is: Do you have a to-do list? Actually, some of us don't even have a to-do list physically. We don't even write it down, but we have a to-do list in our head. Okay, so you either have a to-do list in your head, which I really recommend that you don't keep in there. Your brain, this is worth reminding ourselves all the time, your brain has evolved to be really, really good at certain things and really bad at other things. Your brain is really good at intuition, improvisation, pattern recognition, okay? Your brain is better at these things than any computer that you use in your, in your life. Your brain is terrible at being a storage device for lots of pieces of data. Your brain wasn't evolved for that. Okay, your brain was evolved to make quick decisions based on all the intuition that you have. Um, your brain is equipped to be improvisational and bringing your personality to bear on any situation pattern. So do not keep things in your brain. If you, have a to -do, if you don't have a to-do list, start one today. My favorite uh, software for that these days is called Wonderlist, W-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-S-T. I've used multiple types of software over, over time. My previous favorite one was called Toodledo, T-O-O-D-L-E-D-O. Toodledo is very good, but it's very complex and lots of different options. Now I love Wonderlist because it's so simple. It's so essentialism. It's so essentialist. So it's very simple. I recommend it. And it's free. Now, the thing about our to-do list, it's, it's kind of like our closet, okay? <laughs> but it's worse. <laughs> so your closet, uh, your, your, your clothing, and really any closet of, of stuff, any, any place where you can put things away and have it be out of sight most of the day, it accumulates stuff, as you know, okay? Well, let's just talk about our, your, your clothing closet for now. Especially, um, I think, I imagine women deal with this even more than men because women are more fashion conscious, right? So your closet tends to accumulate clothes over the years that you don't actually wear. And so what happens is we come to our closet and we go, well, I can't get rid of this because I might wear it someday. This is the most dangerous mindset that will allow things and weeds to accumulate in your life and in your closet, right? Um, that will slow you down, uh, drain your willpower, create more anxiety and allow you to uh, 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 deteriorate your decision-making ability. So just like you would go into your closet and be ruthless in your closet and you take out each piece and says, do I absolutely love this piece? Okay. First question. Second question is, do I look great in it? Does it actually really work? And third is, do I actually wear this often? If you ask those three questions, oh, actually there's a fourth question that the book asks, which I love. If I didn't already own this piece of clothing, how much would I pay for it to get this right now? Okay. And the question usually is, well, I wouldn't actually pay for this right now, or I don't really wear this often, or I don't really love this. It's just something I might wear on a, one of those occasional you know, weddings that I go to or something like that. Right. Oh, I don't, you know, I have like, I have like five suits in my closet. And I can count on one hand how many weddings I went to in the last five years. And in the last five years, I wore the same exact suit. So what are the other four suits for? Let's give it away to Goodwill, okay? Or, so so it's, 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 it really inspires me. And I'm going to encourage you. Like, if you do one thing, clean out your closet based on this webinar, you will immediately feel, okay, on a day-to-day -day basis, when you look at your closet, you will immediately feel less overwhelmed, less anxiety, and actually you'll make better decisions just cleaning out your closet. Same thing with your refrigerator or same thing with any other closet. Try this. I mean, every once a month, I mean, this is a really good practice, right? Once a month, spend two hours on a weekend or whatever cleaning out a closet, asking yourself these questions. Do I absolutely love this item? Okay. Is it actually useful? Do I use it often? And if I didn't own it, how much would I pay for it right now? I mean, really, how much would I pay for it if I didn't own it? And the answer is not, not that much. Get rid of it. Give it away to, uh, to, to, to someone else okay, to use. All right. So um, let, me, uh, let me go on to the next uh, major thing that I learned from the book is that it begins – actually, what's interesting is this, the book didn't say enough about this, but I think it's really important. Essentialism 
be, living a life where you actually do what's important begins with deciding what's important to you. I know it sounds so simple, but I actually, I, I do believe that we don't think enough, we don't think frequently enough in our life about what is important to us. And so let me ask, do you, have you clarified recently what are your top priorities in life? And if you're, if you're live and in the chat or if you're watching this, I, I do encourage you to comment. Uh, if you'd like, if you'd like to share with, with everyone, what are your, can you quickly say what your top priorities are? And I'm grateful to say that, of course, I've done the exercise in the past. I'm really clear. And what I really recommend is to be able to list your top priorities in one hand, okay, with each one being a finger, okay? For me, my top priorities are number one, uh, and again, you don't have to have the same priorities. And I think the priorities are important because it reminds you, it helps you make decisions. If, if, if an opportunity comes and it's, it's great for one priority, but it somehow harms a higher priority, the answer should be no. Okay? So um, here, are my, here are my top five. One is spiritual growth, personal, personal growth. Second one is my health. Third one is my, my closest relationships. Fourth one is my business. And fifth one is hobbies. So the nice thing is I have five, which means I can count on one hand. And I would say even three is, the, is, is even better because three is a nice, really essentialist type of number. Five is a little, getting a little bit over, over too, overly too much. I've, lots of life coaches talk about the wheel of life and they have like seven or 10 priorities. I mean, it sounds good, but honestly, in terms of, you t in terms of everyday practice, it's, your brain, yes, seven is supposed to be the number, right, that our brains can keep. But honestly, in my experience, five is even a little too much. So just say five is the maximum number is what I recommend. Uh, if you have more than five, it's too much. And just let those things be optional. You don't have to memorize them. But you should memorize your top five and to be able to quickly, quickly mention it. And I just want to thank everyone who is in the chat and, and mentioning that. And those who are watching this replay, comment below if you'd like to share what your top five are right now. And they can change over time. That's the other thing. So what are your top five right now, like this year, in the next three to six months, okay? All right, so what this means is if a business opportunity comes to me and I think, wow, this could make me, you know, make me a lot of money or I could love doing this for my business, but somehow it, it's gonna consistently harm my, my health because I'm gonna be overworking or it's gonna harm my relationships because I'm gonna be you know, uh, working a lot or spending the time with, with other people. Um, uh, that might make you know my my spouse jealous or whatever, or if it's going to harm my spiritual growth because it's going to make me make decisions that it's going to be profitable, but it's not going to align and uplift my spirituality. I'm going to say no. And if I didn't have these priorities so clearly laid out on my hand, right, it would be it'd be hard to say no. And that's one of the key messages from the book is if you don't know what's important to you you're gonna to tend to want to say yes to everything. And if you say yes to everything, everything gets diluted and you can't really live a life where you are serving your highest contribution, putting your most amount of energy and time in serving your highest contribution. So come up with your top five, three to five priorities and order them in such a way where you are able to make decisions based on this order, okay? I mean, I'll give you another example, right? I'm very clear which hours I work for my business, even though I could get more clients if I worked in the evenings and the weekends. I'm sure I could, but I choose not to because evenings and weekends, I spend more time with maybe personal growth, things for my health, of course, things with my, uh, my wife so, and my, my puppy. Right? So, um, all right, let's go on to the next, the next idea, which is you get – people requesting your help all the time, probably. Especially if you are uh, in my tribe, uh, I, you are probably someone who is warm-hearted, generous, you love helping and caring for other people. So I know that about you. So what that means is you tend to take on other people's problems. I mean, even if it's just a friend, but, but this is especially true when it comes to people in our family, right? People we care so much about, we care what happens. 
uh, or, or even just uh, we're family that we, we, which we're most challenged with on this, or our friends, or even just online. You see someone with a problem and you can, are so concerned about. I love what this book says, which is what happens is when we help more than our boundaries allow us to help. Okay, you first you have to clear about your boundaries, like how much time you help each week. Okay, and and I should I should say that first. I actually have a set amount of time that I do what I call free helping each week, which, by the way, includes checking my Facebook notifications. Isn't that interesting? I check my Facebook notifications once a week. You know that number on Facebook, when you go onto Facebook and you see that red number on the upper right, the, the globe, it's very tempting to see a red number there. They've purposely designed Okay, technology these days has been designed to hypnotize you and to keep you coming back and clicking on things as if we were rats, you know. <laughs> we were like rats pressing something so we get food, okay. So I made a decision to only check my Facebook notifications once a week because I know that when I do that, I will want to comment on what people have commented on and uh, people are asking my help in this or that demands. So when it comes to people asking you for your help, don't rob people of their problems. This is actually very profound. And the book tells a story of a psychologist, uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, who had a, 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 a parents, who had a, a parents come to him, parents of a 25 year old man come to him and says, Hey, you know, our son doesn't think he has a problem, but you need to fix him. He's got this issue and that issue. And then Dr. Cloud listened patiently to, to these parents. And then he gave them a shocking answer. He said, actually, I don't think your son has a problem. I think you have a problem. You are, you know, you, you, you worry about him. You plan his life. You pay this money to try to f me to have me fix his problems, and he's not even here, right? You, you know, you have a problem because you're robbing your son of the opportunity to solve his own problems. You need to stop doing that. And I think that's really profound because how often are we in our life taking care of other people so much that we're actually preventing them the opportunity to solve their own problems? Can you imagine, I mean, if I, you know, try to, I have, right now I have, I have about 30 clients <laughs> I'm coaching right now. It's impossible for me to, to manage every aspect of their business and life. If I did, I would be overwhelmed, I would be depressed because I can't solve all their problems. But I realized that I can give them, in our sessions together, I can give them the very best mindset shift or the very best tool that will allow them, if they apply themselves, if they apply these tools and these shifts to then solve their own problems, and when they solve their own problems, they become more empowered. We are in this life given problems, okay? And this is something I, I, I came to a realization um, some time ago, which really helped, which is problems are actually the currency of spiritual growth. If we didn't have any problems in life, we wouldn't be challenged and we wouldn't apply ourselves and become wiser, more loving, okay, more generous hearted, more forgiving, okay, smarter about how we did things, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. We've heard that. If there were no needs, there would be very, very few inventions. If there were very few problems in life, we wouldn't have the, um, we wouldn't have the courage that or that's developed. Courage isn't needed if there are no problems. Okay, love isn't needed if there were if there was no unkindness, right? Wisdom isn't needed if there were no conundrums. So realize that when you help so much, you are robbing someone else of their problems. Allow them to have it. So have a boundary of when, how much you help. So I help basically on Friday afternoons. Okay, that's when when people e send me email asking me questions. If I have the discipline, I won't reply to them right away. <laughs> Sometimes I don't have the discipline and I'm like, you know, replying very quickly. Um, but 
when I have the discipline, when, I, when, I, when I'm in my right mind, uh, I mean, sometimes people ask me questions that I feel such a kindred spirit and like, okay, I got to respond. But most of the time people ask me questions and I put those questions in a folder called optional response. And I respond to those things on Friday afternoon. And just, I, I spend one hour. And then after my one hour is done, my optional response folder is out of sight. It's not in my inbox. It's not looking at me all the time. It's just on one of the folders. So I just spend one hour responding and then I'm done. And then I go on and do other things. And I also, the rest of my time, uh, in terms of I do a lot of free content, as you know, and I know when I do free content, I'm giving people the mindset shifts, I'm giving them the tools to then solve their own problems instead of getting really involved and, and robbing them of their problems. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, let's go on to talking about pruning our to-do list. Very, very important. We talked about kind of like your closet, how do you prune your closet? Now let's apply that to your to-do list. So when it comes to your to-do list, your tasks, um, your projects, ask yourself these questions. Number one, you look at an item. Are you deeply inspired by it? Are you deeply inspired by it? Or if it's just like, oh, it's okay. Maybe it's a, you know. Okay, if it doesn't pass that test, put it in a folder called Someday Maybe. Or just put it in the folder, but don't put a due date on it. This is very dangerous. Only put due dates on tasks that are both urgent and important. Okay? If it's not deeply inspiring to you, and if it's not something you know you've got to get done, like taxes, then don't put a due date on it. Just have it in a list of items that you only look at when you have some free time. Okay? Um, actually, this, is, this, this list of questions I'm giving you is particularly suited for, for projects, like you know, things you're going to create. Am I deeply inspired by it? Am I good at it or passionate about becoming good at it? Because why would you spend your life doing things that you're not passionate about or you're not passionate about getting good at? Okay? So every request that comes to you, every opportunity, Am I deeply inspired by it? Do I really want to become really good at it? Okay. And the third really good question is, will it meet a significant need in the world? So if you have a choice of five directions you could go, ask yourself these questions about each direction. Am I deeply inspired? Do I really want to get good at this kind of thing? And does it meet a significant need in the world? Okay. And actually, there's a fourth question. If you're still, you still have too many, right? The fourth question to ask is, if I didn't have that task or project, am I willing to work hard to, to, to get this opportunity? And sometimes it's no, not really. Right? Okay. So, um, oh, really interesting. A uh, couple of psychological biases that we have that are blocking us from being able to prune down our task list. One is we tend to overvalue what is already on our list, or we tend to overvalue what we already own. Okay, this is true for your closet. You already own it, so you overvalue it. You think, well, because I have it. You don't even think this, but now you realize that you do think this is because, because I have it, it must be important. But then we realize if we didn't have it, we wouldn't spend money buying it, right? Same thing with your task list. Just because it's on your task list doesn't mean it's important. So remember that you're probably overvaluing what's on your task list. So just Err on the side of thinking that nothing's important on your task list or very few things are important, okay? Also, um, sometimes we, uh, we have invested our energy in a project and because when we invest energy in it, we think it's important when actually we should have admitted failure or should have admitted, say, that was a mistake to spend time on this. Let me go on to something else. So just know that you have these biases that if you knew them, you would value the items on your list far less, okay? So um, let's go on to a very interesting section, which is the practice of saying no. I hope that by sharing some of these techniques with you, you'll actually practice this and you'll be able to say no in a more graceful way. So first of all, why is it hard to say no? So think about everything from requests from family members, invitations from friends, emails that come to you asking for something or asking you to do something for them. Why is it hard to say no? It's because of, again, human evolution. 
We were evolved to be tribal people. And in a tribe, because of hundreds of years of that cultural evolution of, of a tribe that we used to be in, uh, there are certain social norms. And we basically said yes to everything because a request wouldn't be made unless there was a reasonable reciprocity that came back. And so there was not that many requests in human tribes, right? Well, now we get requests left and right. People are, there's, there's no more social norms around requests very much. So uh, that's why we, the human, human being is very interesting. We literally have evolved to feel uncomfortable, physical discomfort when we reject someone, when we say no. We literally feel some physical discomfort. No wonder you have a hard time saying no, okay? And also, emotionally, we feel awkward and we feel this kind of social pressure. That's all human evolution stuff, tribal stuff. Okay, that's that we're dealing with. So that's why, and, and what's interesting is we've also evolved to feel a physical rush when we say yes. Why is that? Because in a tribe, if people didn't help each other, if people didn't say yes to each other, the tribe falls apart. But these days, we don't really live in a tribe, we live in family units, and even some of us don't live in family units. So, so we're, we're very, very, very individualistic now. And so we have to be really careful who we let in to be part of our tribe. You get to choose who your tribe is these days, and they could live thousands of miles away, an online tribe, right? So you have to actually build up your muscle. Your muscle of saying no has atrophied over time. So you need to build up your muscle of saying no, okay? And so um, realize that if you don't say no enough, you won't be able to say yes to the things that are most important to you. So a priority yes, actually requires you to say a lot of no's. So let me share with you a couple of ways, uh, ways that are kind of graceful, more graceful to say, to say no. So now I have to practice this all the time because people ask me to do this or invite me to do that. And, um, <laughs> and I, I love what uh, Frank just asked in our live chat. says, hey, you know, this is important to practice saying no. Anyone else want to pair up and practice rejecting each other's requests? I love that. That's actually a great idea. Role playing is actually really helpful. And, it, and Andy replied, no. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. All right. So a couple of graceful ways to say no. One is basically my plate is full. And I, I like to say I'm honored that you thought of me for this, but I just currently don't have a bandwidth to do it. Um, but again, I'm honored and I thank you for this. So I really help, hope you find the right person. Okay. Um, another way of saying it, and I, by the way, if you look in the, 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 the book notes, there'll, there'll be other scripts that, uh, that are included there. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just kind of say the basic, the, the basic ways of doing it. The second way of doing it is to say, I'm not the best choice for this. And I actually say this to people all the time and people ask me to speak on, uh, tell us summit or you know speak on this thing or or actually I get client requests and I say oh I'm not really the best for this I recommend you refer you to one of my my own clients who is also a business coach and they would be better fit for you or whatever so so again you could say you know I'm honored that you thought of me for this but I've, I've considered the project and I actually believe I'm not the best choice I'm gonna see I'm gonna see if anyone comes to mind so get this I'm gonna see if anyone comes to mind that would be better fit and if so I'm definitely gonna let you know okay so um, that's a great way of saying it. Or if I have someone immediately comes to mind, I'll let, I'll let them know, look, have you, have you, I recommend contacting so-and-so, right? All right, and the next one is not now, but later. Very useful. So someone invites you to hang out and just say, you know, I've got a lot going on right now, uh, you know, and you can, you can use your, your, your family as an excuse. Oh my, I've got a lot going on with my family right now. <laughs> Um, but how about, how about, uh, later, later in the summer, uh, please, can you ping me again later in the summer and we'll, and we'll see if we can get together. I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you again, get the instrumentation again. Um, let's go on to the next, uh, option, which is I can't do X, but I can do Y. Okay. So my plate is too full for me right now to do this, but I could make a quick email intro to my friend so-and-so to see if she might be available for it. So you're not committing for your friend, but you're just saying, you know, she may or may not be available. I'm happy to make an email intro and you can take it from there. How's that? Right. So that's a, that's a good one. Um, 
Oh, a- another one is I, I say, you know, I can't really respond. This is a great question. I can't really respond to this right now, but I would recommend you post in this Facebook group and all of you can, uh, can say this, you know, we have our, our Facebook group, our highest work. So when someone asks you a question uh, that you think, well, the group might have some response because you know, I can't, I don't, uh, my bandwidth is really uh, um, challenged right now. I can't respond to this, but if you post this group, chances are you're going to get a response pretty quickly. So, okay. Final way, which is a really interesting way is to use an email auto reply. Now, it's not my favorite way, but I do get email auto replies all the time from uh, friends of mine who are like much more famous than me and busier. And I email them and I get a reply back. So, you know, I'm really slammed with emails right now, but I really value, uh, I, re- I value hearing from you. I do read all my emails and I'm going to respond to you uh, as soon as I can. So, you know, it's a nice, nice kind of reply. And definitely if you're going on a trip, okay, do an email autoresponder and uh, most email software can do this. Gmail has this for free installed um, called a vacation auto reply. Uh, or get this. If you're going to be working on a focus on a project, you're going to be focused on the launch for the next two weeks or three weeks or <laughs> three months. Okay. The author of the book essentialism actually had an email reply auto reply for eight months as he worked on the book. The auto reply had the subject line, in monk mode and the reply and the, the body of the set message says something like um, dear friends and colleagues um, I, I, I really I enjoy hearing from you and I would love to give you a, a more proper reply but I'm focused right now on completing my book I'm going to be um, I'm just going to, to focus most of my time on this so I will reply to you when I kind of come back up for air right so that's a really nice, nice uh, way of saying no is to let, let the computer say no for you in a graceful way. Um, if it's hard to say no, okay, let this be your default response. Let me get back to you on that. That's, that sounds great. And you know what? Let me get back to you on this. I, I, I got to sleep on it. Okay. It's so tempting when someone asks you, especially in the moment, right, to say, you know, can you do something? And it's so tempting to say, okay, all right practice this and this this will this will require a um a role play with each other maybe or a role play with a friend who who who, can, who you love doing this with to say at, have them ask you questions that sound really tempting and interesting and say you know what let me get back to you on this let me sleep on it you can say let me get back to you on this or let me sleep on this or if you if, if it's some kind of invitation say you know what i gotta check my calendar and i'll get back to you on this and if your calendar is with you, just say, you know what, I, I got to actually, conf- I gotta actually look at some possible appointments I might have. I'm going to need to confirm them, and then I'll get back to you on this. So practice saying, let me get back to you, because with distance, you'll make wiser choices after having slept on it, having having some time. And also, it's nice to be able to reply in an email, because then you'll be able to craft your graceful no, rather than not being able to say something graceful like on the phone or in person. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, Andy said in the, uh, in the chat, uh, sleeping on it seems to be the best choice of jumped by a question. I like that. We are jumped by requests and questions and we didn't know this. Oh my God, I just been jumped by a question. Default answer. Let me sleep on it. Okay. So, um, next section of the book I thought was interesting. Next tip is remember that throughout your day, you frequently forget that you have free will, (laughs) okay? Throughout the day, because of demands and requests, because we have evolved again to say yes, being part of a tribe, we've evolved to say yes all the time. And saying yes doesn't just mean, yes, I'll go to that event, or yes, I'll, I'll join you for this, right? Saying yes also means opening the email. Really, every email you get is a, hey, can I get your attention? Every notification you get is, hey, can I get your attention? So it's a funny thing is we are confusing all these casual requests as some kind of a tribal request of can we have your you know, attention, right? <laughs> um, so every chat that I see is I'm like, ah, that's a tribal request. No, it's not. I have free will. I can say no to that right now. So no, really. So remind yourself that the tendency is to forget that you have free will, forget that you have a choice. But I'm here to remind you, look me in the eye right now. Every moment of the day, you have a choice. 
every request that you get, you have a choice to say no. Okay. So, uh, oh, uh, the reason why this is, this is so interesting is because of there's a whole psychological concept called learned helplessness. And I know those of us watching this right now, hopefully you don't feel helpless all the time, but there are degrees of learned helplessness. And I, I bet you there are certain times in your day when you have learned helplessness and you don't even realize it. Uh, the example of this is, is the example of the elephant who, um, when, when the elephant was a baby, it was tied to a little stake in the ground. It, the stake in the ground and a rope tied to the elephant's foot was enough to keep the elephant from, from running away. Okay? But as the elephant grew, um, they just kept replacing the size of the rope, but they didn't replace the stake in the ground. They just replaced that the rope got bigger. And eventually, the elephant is an adult. And what's interesting is that the elephant, having as a baby, tried tugging on the stake and couldn't escape. And then, you know, they kept replacing the rope. They just, the elephant just assumed that he couldn't escape. Even though the rope, as an adult, he could have easily yanked and the stake would have kept, uh, would, have, would have dislodged and it could have run away. So same thing about your everyday actions is you have this learned helplessness about email. Maybe, oh, email came in. I got to open it. I got to read it. Or, oh, notification came in. I got to check it. Oh, so-and-so requested something. I got I to gotta say yes. Phone rings. Well, I got to pick up the phone. No, you have a choice, okay, to not pick up the phone, to not check that notification, to not open that email, to not, you know, say yes to so-and-so's requests, okay? You can even say no to my requests, even though, you know, I hope you say yes to most of my invitations. But you can say no to, my, uh, to watching my videos, okay? <laughs> Practice with me. I know I'm sacrificing myself here as a content creator, but you, you can. You practice with me and hopefully you'll practice with all those marketers that you really don't want to, whose emails you really don't want to open. All right, so, um, okay, so I just have a couple of things. Oh, I, I have a chart to show you now. Uh, first of all, the key mindset shift about essentialism is to realize that most things, and I, I think I've mentioned this in the beginning, most things in your life, most requests, most notifications, most emails, most invitations, most tasks, most things are not important. Okay. Whereas before, we used to think, again, because of our human evolution and because of the tribal uh, reciprocity, we used to think that most things were important because if it's demanded of us, it must be important. Otherwise, the tribe wouldn't ask us of that of us. Modern, modern day, oh, the email came in, it must be important. Oh, a notification, oh, invitation, I, must, sh I should say yes to this. Phone call must be important, okay? Now I'm asking you to change your mind and start saying from now on, most messages, tasks, invitations are not important. And actually, very, very few things are important. Very few tasks on your list are important. Take away the rest. Put it in a place where you don't have to look at it all the time. Put it on a list where there's no to do, there's no due date. Okay. Most invitations are useless. Most emails are useless. Okay. Most messages, most phone calls are useless. That's a key mindset shift. Most projects and opportunities are not important. And let me now show you a, a, a chart, which I like a lot. Uh, and this is also in, in, my, in my book notes, but I just want to show you this chart. Isn't that a great chart? If you still, if you do not make a conscious choice, okay, to rise above your ancient, outdated human evolution of everything's important, you will be pulled in all these different directions and you will get very little done and you will literally feel overstretched. I mean, look at this. this all these things are pulling at you. You will literally break. You will literally break, right? Whereas now I'm asking you to make a conscious choice to realize that most things, you see most of this, these circle, most things are not important and very few things calling at you are actually important. Okay. So remember this diagram is what we actually face every single day, every single day. And this is also true for your career, for your business. Most opportunities are diffused and only very, very few opportunities are the ones that deeply inspire you the ones that you actually want to get really good at, that ones that meet a significant need in the world, 
and the ones where you would actually sacrifice something for, that's worth sacrificing something for, okay? So with that, um, I, I feel like I want to, I want to end, uh, I want to end this, um, my presentation and actually I'm going to invite those who are live here to ask any questions. So if you have anything you want to chime in and say, you can either unmute your mic and if you want to unmute your, uh, your video, I would love to see your face as well. Um, uh, or you can chat in the chat. Any, any questions? And those who are listening to the replay, here's your chance to put any questions in the comments area as well. Or any uh, reflections that anyone here on the chat wants to, wants to make. Okay, great. All right. Oh, if there is nothing, then I want to thank you for being here, um, for joining me for this presentation. Hey, I hope this is helpful for you. Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. It's Bernie. Hey, Bernie. Hey, let me put my video on real quick too. I've been wanting to come to your live calls and it never worked out, but today was perfect. So it's good All to be right. Here. Yay. Hello. So I kind of have a little reflection if you don't mind and sure. maybe a question will come out of it. But sure. lately I've been noticing in my personal and professional world, there's been a lot of relationships changing. And I've been hearing the word like transformation and evolving um, quite a bit lately. And I feel like the one side of me feels maybe rejected or abandoned in some way where relationships are changing as I'm, you know, kind of leveling up and, and vibrate, vibrate, you know, the way I'm vibrating versus the way I used to vibrate with these, these friendships. Um, on one hand, I, I see the benefit in that. On one hand, I see how that can benefit me and the person if we're no longer serving each other. And, and this, I'm just talking about like even like personal relationships and professional relationships. But on the other hand, it's like the human side of me does feel the, the, the knife wound in the chest, you know? Mm. Um, it's hard not to take it personally. It's hard not to feel rejected and abandoned, if you will. Yeah. I don't know really what the question is, but I kind of feel like even as we're getting better, even as we're evolving, even, even as we're transforming, things have to die in order for new things to be birthed. How do you wrap your head and heart around that topic because I think it's mm. no matter how conscious you are about what's going on, it still stings. Totally. Wow. Love the question. Love the reflection. I so uh, can, can relate to you because yeah, I, I mean, as you know, I made this dramatic change in my business model. Um, I used to do a lot of what's called joint ventures, a lot of affiliate marketing, um, you know, you've all seen this, right? Like people who say, you get emails to say, let me introduce you to my friend, Bob, who is an expert in this. And next week, let me introduce you to my friend, Sarah, who, you know, like they have so many friends, like, <laughs> like, like how does this marketer have all these friends? So called, um, I used to be one of those people. Like I used to introduce a new friend to my list, like every week because they were introducing me to their list. And I do that. And two years ago, I stopped doing all that. And I literally feel like I lost friends because, you know, I, I said no. I had to say no to promoting them to my list because I no longer believed in how they marketed their business. I didn't want my list to get infected with that. Um, and, and guess what? Some people say, well, gosh, George, you're so selfish now. Like, you don't promote people anymore. And I said, no, actually, no, that's not true. I, I promote content on social media that I think is worthwhile uh, regardless. But... but and also what's interesting is I've got, I've become so prolific ever since I became more focused that I have so much content to share that, you know, I don't want to overwhelm my audience. I have enough content just myself sharing stuff, but, um, uh, yes, it feels, it, it, it hurts because I, I still think very well. I mean, really some of my joint venture partners helped put my, put me on the map, you know, and I helped put them on the map too. And now that's no longer happening, but now, what, I, what comforts me is to look at all of you. You know, I couldn't have created these new friendships and these new um, feelings of connection if I were still that self. And right. so, and, and, and this, this didn't happen right away. I mean, it really has taken two years to evolve to a place where I feel more comfortable that, guess what? I kind of have a new tribe now. I really do. 
it's funny, like uh, I had an audience member say, George, I actually liked when you were introducing all these different things, all these different people to me, because I got to see all these different uh, offers. And I think most of my tribe is, was, was glad at that, but it, it has taken me about two years. <laughs> I know that's probably not the best uh, response, but I, I do want to- I, I think it's a fantastic response, because here's why, as you were talking, I was just thinking to myself, well, hello, I mean, I'm here in your tribe. I didn't even know about you maybe two, three months ago. And I think I actually listened to an interview that you did with one of my online friends, Natasha Sinkovich yes. on her, yes. her podcast. And so all of a sudden I realized as you're talking, I'm like, well, George and I probably wouldn't be connected now if George was the old George and if I was the old Bernie. And maybe we are coming, you know, we're converging on, on that path, right? Yeah. Because we're aligned and, and we're vibrating at the same frequencies, if you will. So yeah. for me, it's like, feeling comforted by knowing that now I'm open to these types of relationships with what you're doing, that it is okay to let go of the relationships that maybe won't serve me, at least not right now. Yeah. So, so I just want to personally thank you because I haven't had a chance to be in here yet. And I personally thank you individually, but I want to tell everybody here and the whole world is listening. Like George, what you're doing is, is so unique and so amazing. And it's it just, it, it, it fills me with inspiration and it fuels me with so much desire to continue to do the work I do because it's very similar to your philosophy and the way you're showing up. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of your tribe. I, I can't think of another person right now in the world who's doing what you do. And I thank you for, for being the pioneer in that. Well, thank you. Well, you are. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really, no, I, it's true. It, it actually, the last two years have felt very lonely because um, there's a lot more money to be made in the old way I was doing it. And I, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make that choice, especially for, for some people, it's hard to make the choice of doing less hyped up manipulative marketing when they still need to make their financial, you know, needs. I, I, I totally get it. And so some of my partners are totally, you know, totally because they have a team to support and they don't want to let go of their team. So I, I totally, you know, it's, it, it takes yeah, compassion. Yeah, on gratitude, something. Oh yeah. Andy, please. Hello. Um, hi, uh, I'm Andrew. Uh, I just came across uh, your like new business model uh, about, uh, I don't know, five months ago or something. Yeah. And uh, before that, uh, I, I basically lost like a lot of hope and I, I just found like in a notebook when I was in the diffused focus mode, uh, 2013, George Cow, something to do with eroding productivity and joy and stuff, social media marketing tips. I was like, hmm, I was interested in this. What's this about? And all of a sudden, uh, I went to your website, saw all of the mind maps and all this sort of stuff. And... Honestly, uh, I, I don't see how anyone could call that sort of stuff selfish because I have not had so much relevant information thrown at me before. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, man. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm on a journey to share information and yet try to do it in a more consumable way. So, <laughs> so thanks, I, thanks, Andy. I yeah, really appreciate your, your speaking. Up. George, this, this is Angela. I have the I, same experience as Andy. <laughs> I was trying to, I have been out, I have not had a regular job since 2008. Mm. I started a couple of businesses that did well until the economy caught up with them too. Wow. And I've just been searching and then someone Re referred me to your mind map work and when I saw that divergence where you say look if you're good at content and you're good at you know creating these things take this other path and for the first time in years somebody wasn't rushing me into this <laughs> place where I felt like a used car salesman somebody yeah. was saying that what my heart and gut felt was the correct way for me to share and build and give offer to the world yeah. was, you know, there that I didn't have to swim upstream. I didn't have to betray myself. So mm -hmm. I am so glad that I connected with you. Just like Andy, it was like, it was like the clouds parted and the sun shone. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am so grateful uh, for you all. Really. Thank you, Angela. Um, 
and, and Bernie and Andy for, for speaking up. And I know Laura and uh, is, is in there too, and Frank and Shweta. Um, well, I, uh, let, me, let me actually, um, let's see, there was, there was a question here from, from Laura about whether essentialism is, is a process of slowing down and being mindful of what you see, hear, and respond to rather than react constantly. And I love that, um, Laura, for, for bringing that in. I yes, I think so. Um, Laura, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, you can if you, because I know you're a, you, you, teach, you teach this stuff to people. Um, essentialism, it, it, actually this was a part of the book where he talked about how you only have this moment. You only have this moment to do and enjoy and experience what is happening right now. Oftentimes we are caught up in remembering the mistakes of the past or the regrets of the past or the embarrassments or the disappointments or we're anxious about what's going to come up. But the truth, and I think you all agree, is you can't actually predict the future. And of course, you cannot correct the past. We don't have a time machine yet. And uh, given all this time machine movies, you probably shouldn't go back to the past and correct them anyway. <laughs> um, you can only be in this moment, enjoy, learn, and, and if you do that, um, if you slow down enough, you actually become more productive. But Laura, your, your mic is unmuted. Do you want to say anything about that? Well, thank you, George. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, yes, uh, just to summarize a bit, uh, what you have said about the excellent present moment, um, and that's what I'm alluding to in this statement, and I really honor that. I try to honor it as best I can, although it is the challenge with technology being the rapidity of technology and everything that's mentioned, the antithesis of slowing down technology is a bit yeah. the antithesis of slowing down. So it's difficult. It's a challenge. But yet there's a lot of resources in technology, pro, uh, people uh, everywhere inspired by, by this new thought, the new, a movement, I think, that's supporting the slowing down and being more mindful. Mm. Yes, I, I agree. In fact, if any of you have resources on that, um, I think Wisdom 2.0 is one of those um, conferences and organizations that's trying to bring together technology companies to bring more mindfulness. Uh, they were thinking more about mindfulness in their cult company cultures, but also hopefully mindfulness and how they, how they affect all of us, you know? So thank you for, for bringing that forth. You're well, I, I, uh, I've kept enough time from all of you who are live here. So I do want to uh, let you go for the rest of the day, but I thank you for being here. I wish you a day forward knowing, and I always love to remind all of us of this, that knowing that if you focus on what is most important to you, that everything else will follow. Um, this has been said in the spiritual literature all, you know, for thousands of years, focus on your highest, uh, priorities and, and, and um, focus on your highest contribution and everything else will follow. Because the truth is you are being taken care of by a force, I believe, that's much greater than any of us and that's much greater than any of your mistakes. And so go forward today know in that sense of security and calmness and joy and confidence and know that everything's going to turn out well. And I'm so glad to be in this tribe with all of you. So be well and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Thank you, George. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.